Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. This is one I'm pretty excited about. Uh, this is a 2010 Chevy Impala LT. Uh, this is actually my car. And although this review isn't gonna be totally about all the things that I've done and this and that, we are gonna kinda get into the, um, th you know, this car and different versions of it and Impalas that came before and what the Impala name is about and things like that. So uh, this is the ninth gen Impala. This came out in 2006. This replaced, replaced of course, the eighth gen, which ran from 2000 to 2005. Uh, that was the first front drive uh, Impala, and there were a couple other, you know, a couple other notable things. But they've they've been making them since the late 50s, and they were very popular in the 60s and kind of early 70s, and then I think they kind of dwindled out in the 80s. They were back for two years in the 1990s, based on the Caprice Classic, and then back in 2000 as kind of a front drive four-door sedan, and then this was kind of the refreshed version of that. Um, after this did come the 10th gen, and then production ended uh, in, I believe, 2020. If that's wrong, I'll put a correction on screen. I can't remember. It all runs together a little bit. But this, again, this came out in 06. Uh, there were a couple different uh, versions of this. There was the LS, LT, and the LTZ. You could get the 3.5 liter or the 3.9 liter V6, and then there was also the SS, which had a 5.3 liter V8. Uh, later on, they changed the engine, oh, and this, this had a four-speed automatic. Uh, these, the 2010 was the last of the four-speed autos and the V6s and the 5.3 V8s. After that, they changed it. I guess we'll get into that a little later on. But anyway, 2006 is when these started. Um, as far as styling goes, I mean, they're, I don't think they're hideous, but they're a little bit doughy. It's not like a super um, exciting shape or anything. We'll kind of get into it here. So for the hood, you do have some nice creases on the front. Uh, typical Impala thing, you'll have two lenses for the high and low beams and then two in the rear for the brake lights, which we'll kind of talk about then. Um, these grills here, this is, again, this is an LT. The up, up lever, up, ugh, if you optioned it as an LT or the LTZ, you would have uh, fog lights here. Uh, standard grill, 16 inch painted alloy wheels going back the side, GM mark of excellence for what that stands for there. Uh, body color trim. Going back the side here, uh, body color mirrors, new sunroof on this car. It does have XM radio, therefore you have the antenna there. Uh, nice chrome trim. Again, these only came as a four-door. I do like this uh, window in the sail panel. I've always liked cars that had a window separate from the door. I think that makes it a little bit easier to get in and out of and uh, a little bit brighter and more open in the cabin. And of course, it gives you a smaller C-pillar, which I think looks a little bit nicer. Uh, going back the side here, you do see this little crease line here. This is kind of an Impala thing. Uh, of course, a lot of other cars have that. <laughs> but you'll see the line coming kind of from the headlamp there that curves up and then goes to the back. And then you have this line up over the front here. You'll notice this rear line, I think, notably on like a Mercedes E-Class of late until they refreshed it, until the refreshed W212. But you'd see that on the prior generation of Impala. That's kind of an Impala line. Uh, going to the back again two lenses back here for the turn signals and brake lights and this is an american car so you have uh, just red no amber lights on this um, in the in the back you have a fifth brake light here this is the ss spoiler that's been added this car isn't perfectly clean by the way it's been used so it's not bad it is actually really clean really no significant scratches dents or wear uh, other than this bumper has a little crease in it um a couple things that need attention on this this emblem has been kind of peeling ever since I bought it, never gotten around to replacing it. It also has the dealer um, decal or badge on the back there that's I've just left, who cares. Uh, going back the side, this side's really in good shape as well. I like the ground effects here, that's decent, at least they did something, it's not just rounded. Uh, this car does need new headlamps, they're starting to peel a little bit inside. Once, um, once things calm down after COVID or if I start driving this car again, uh, a lot more we'll get to that. One thing that's kind of interesting too is they didn't paint these strips going back the side here. So that's kind of cool. I do like that the plastic in the windows is blacked out. I like that. I think that's a kind of a cool, cool look for it. Again, not hideous. I don't think it's a, a hideous car in any way. Um, but again, it's not very inspiring. It's, yeah, it's, it's a little bland. But again, there's a reason I bought this car. I do kind of like this stuff, so I am a little biased with it. Anyway, let's take a look. We'll dig right into it here. Um, this is not the key that would have come with with it but this is a key that i'm using uh this is kind of the gm key fob but it's integrated into a switch blade you can get these online they're really cool uh, that's not why i got it but <laughs> it, it does work pretty well these buttons are worn off it is cheap uh, the original ones are fine but press this button here and the trunk will open uh, while we're on the buttons so this is lock unlock and then that's remote start and then that's your alarm so to remote uh, to remote start the car you press the lock 
and then I think you press and hold the remote start button, which is really cool. All these Impalas had remote start, which I think is just a really neat option that uh, a lot of higher end cars really don't have. And I really like remote start. I think that's a, a really nice feature to have. But anyway, okay, so starting with the trunk, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. You can see the back of this represents kind of the back of the trunk. And then these seats uh, fold 60-40 in addition to that. So again, huge trunk, uh, relatively low load floor here, nice and wide, nice and deep, everything. I've got some mats down here to protect it. Below that we have the spare tire. All this is in great shape. Trunk pan is perfect. Um, and we also have the license plate frame there for the front, which has never been installed. There's the uh, tag with all the codes. This is, I can't remember the paint code for this exactly but I, it's a switchblade silver metallic which was a you know pretty common one the interesting thing is that when i bought this car and this is covered with carpet which i like that's kind of nice when i bought this car you would see these all over the place if you went to the walmart parking lot you would come out there would be like 10 impalas out there that were silver and now you only see one or two and they're all beat to death um, these cars were meant to be used they weren't meant to be preserved so to find one this nice is a little bit rare this isn't the nicest out there but um, it's got 103,000 miles on it, so it's been kept pretty well uh, for that mileage. This has been used. It's meant to be used. It's been used. Uh, take a look under the hood here. All right, so here we have a 3.5 liter V6 uh, transverse mounted, mated to a 4-speed automatic. So here's where we're going to get into the engines a little bit. The 8th gen Impala came with a 3.5, or I'm sorry, 3.4 liter and 3.8 liter V6 uh, with also all of them came with a four-speed automatic, the uh, 4L60E. And then the SS versions came with a supercharged 3.8 V6. They bumped it up and changed the engines around a little bit for these. The 3.4s and the 3.8s are kind of known for intake manifold gaskets. These engines don't have that. I don't think they're a ro more robust engine, but I don't think they're too terribly troublesome either. Uh, nice and it, everything's nice and smooth. It, it's well, you know we'll get into that in the drive, but it's good smooth power. This engine has been relatively problem free and it's been decent. Okay, so 2010. So this is kind of the last of the old style uh, cars. For anybody who says they don't build them like they used to, this is literally the latest point at which they built them like they used to, right? So again, the back in the day these were rear drive V8 powered or inline six powered, and uh, you could get it as a coupe or. or um, or a convertible, but there were also sedans. But of course, all the cars back then pretty much were uh, rear drive. But this is kind of like a mainstream American car now, just as much as it would have been then. So this is kind of the end of, they don't build them like they used to, which is kind of why I own it. There's the editorial comment on it. Anyway, so this came with, like I said, a three and a half liter V6. You could also get a 3.9 liter V6. The SS came with a 5.3 liter V8. Up until 2010, those were the only engines, and they all came with a four-speed uh, automatic. In 2011, they changed it. The body style remained largely the same. They changed the grills. Uh, they painted over that chrome strip in the back. They changed the wheels around a little bit. They changed a couple of the options. I think they started throwing in more options to make them a little bit more appealing. Because after all, the car was really falling behind then and getting a little bit long in the tooth. So they did that, and they switched to a... Three point, it was a 3.6 liter uh, V6 and a six speed automatic. The six speeds I don't think are terrible. Um, I don't think they're worse than this four speed. I don't think they were any better though. And the 3.6 liter V6s I've heard of having a lot of issues with the timing chains uh, where pretty much the, the engine has to come out, which this is a, an overhead valve engine. So the cam is in the block. It doesn't have dual overhead cams. So there's no timing chain that's really serviceable. The, the crankshaft, um, one revolution of the crankshaft is basically two revolutions of the camshaft, and that's it. It's a good sturdy chain. It's not really serviceable. It's in there for the duration, um, which I think does help it be a little bit more robust. So you're definitely not going to have an issue with this at 100,000 miles with timing chain issues. You might have other things going on, but you won't have that. So again, this is kind of the last of sort of the more reliable, basic stuff. This doesn't have variable valve timing. Um, there is some debate on that. They said it was, you read some places it says it does, some places it doesn't, but it isn't like, t it's not controlled in the same way that a lot of systems are. It's very different in, in that way. Um, yes, other than that, four-speed automatic. Everything here is decent to service. You can get to the belts. You can see the whole way around the engine pretty much. Uh, brake fluid reservoir up here. Here's your air cleaner. Um, oil fill and dipstick right up front. Your battery's right there. You have to pull out this bar to get to that. Uh, coolant, 
this is their rad cap and then you have their overflow bottle there here's some fuses windshield wiper fill there your alternators right here on the front um, yeah it's it's not too bad AC is easy to get to these fans are super easy to change out um, we've done all the motor mounts on this they're not too bad there's one right down here uh, one under the transmission not terrible uh, the hood doesn't open too terribly far so there is kind of that and just one strut uh, it does fine no issues everything's in pretty decent shape under here there's as you can see there's a little bit of rust and corrosion I mean these these coolant pipes really need to be changed but um, I haven't the other thing is that this you know you can see it's just a little bit crusty this sits in a garage a lot of the time it's not the most dry garage so you do get a little bit of work or um, corrosion it could use some work but again this car gets used so I don't try to fuss with it too much give it good maintenance and just about leave it at that all right we'll start here at the back fuel filler is on the driver's side so that's kind of convenient um, again split folding rear seats you just pull this tab and then those come down same as kind of on the other side you have this console that folds out in the middle little cup holder there that's yeah, pretty soft these seats are incredibly comfortable I mean they're just so pillowy and soft um, legroom is decent it's not really what you'd expect in a large car or even a mid-sized car. This has less leg room than like a 2014 Toyota Corolla, just by a little bit, which is kind of disappointing. Otherwise, you do have a door pocket here, a nice pull here, window switch. Um, these are actual like real metal um, chrome enameled or some type of bright work there for the, the door uh, handle. Otherwise, it's all just vinyl, basic stuff. And this is a cloth interior, more of a velour. It's extremely soft and velvety. I really do like that. It's I really do like this for a seating material. You have a little bin down here, um, some grab handles above. It's pretty airy, some big C pillars there on the inside. They do project a, quite a bit in the inside. Uh, pretty hefty speakers there in the back. Uh, decent view from the front, yeah, not bad. All right, and the last thing here uh, with the seats, you can pull this tab right here and this bottom cushion comes up and you have these hooks here to hang like groceries or something and then you have this little well down in here and I believe the seats would fold there you go so now you have a really wide low uh, load floor so you can definitely get a lot in here but again the main thing is that this back seat is uh, other than the legroom it's very soft very plush pretty pretty wide this is a very wide car uh, kind of long too this is about as long as an SL which although it's a two-seater that is a pretty long car this won't take long with the features so um, controls on the driver's side only for the seat really uh, otherwise it's uh, just manual there uh, on the other side you have lumbar up here and then this is manual recline you do have power adjustments just for the base uh, everything's manual on the other side get into the door panel here you have lock and unlock basic um, all your window switches here only the driver's side is automatic here are your mirror controls it's your lockout for the windows again some nice trays here doors in the speaker uh, this is just a little air vent to blow some air onto the window there for defrost one thing that is really nice about this car is that it has plastic wood trim and well i guess the nice part isn't that it's plastic the thing is that the trim looks nice i th i think i think that uh, wood trim makes a car look proper and the thing is that this is plastic you can kind of tell it's very polished this is gm stuff this is just what they do but the thing is, you know, these cars can be 20 years old and they still have really nice trim. I mean, it looks okay. It doesn't really, doesn't really crack, doesn't split, doesn't fade. So <laughs> it is extremely durable, which kind of goes with uh, the rest of the car. So I do kind of like that. I do have an appreciation for that. Go ahead and start it on up here. So you have your key on the steering wheel, steering column. I'll turn that fan down just a hair. All right. Uh, starting up here, you do have these grab handles, uh, visors that flip down with some decent lights there. This is a microphone for the OnStar system. Uh, the mirror is manual dim. And then you do have, you can press here to make a phone call uh, with OnStar. That's your OnStar button. That's for an emergency. This is kind of like just for information. Typical OnStar stuff. Uh, again, no sun uh, sunroof on this. So for the seats, we'll just take a look at this one. You do have really thick bolsters. It's an incredibly soft, uh, just not the most supportive, but very soft, very wide. It's a decent seat. Same for the headrests. Same for the headrests there. All right, center console. You do have some like vinyl-y leather on here, some personal items in there, but it's a nice deep uh, cup, um, 
nice deep console. Up here you have cup holders. This is one thing I've added. This car did not come factory or um, wasn't optioned with heated seats, so I did add those. I actually replaced this whole console with one from a junkyard, and then I drilled holes into this for the, the switches there, which I've tried to integrate um, decently well as best I could. I didn't really want to drill out the other one because if I go, ever go to sell this or something, I, I can always rip that out and it'll be 100% factory. Next, you have the shifter. So again, it's a four speed. Uh, the gauge is gonna flicker here, roll. It's gonna be a little weird. This is all dot matrix uh, displays here, but basically PRND and then three, two, and one. The interesting thing is that nothing here is labeled. It never was in any of them ever. So you just either, either have to count or look at the gauge in front of you. I don't find that all that difficult. Most cars, after all, um, you know, you go back three clicks to drive. So just, you know, one, two, three, there you are. But some people find that. All right, moving from the shifter, um, we'll take a look next to the steering wheel. So these are your cruise control buttons over here. Um, resume and set, and then um, you have to turn the whole thing on and off through here, and then that cancels and defeats everything. Over here, you have all your audio controls, seek and scan, or um, forward or backward as far as tracks. This will switch to the next preset, and then back here you do have volume controls. They mimic those kind of on the other side here uh, to shift up or down on that six-speed automatic that they added on the 2011 on cars. Um, kind of hard to see right now with the sun, but you have a pedal here for the parking brake, and then you let go of that to release it. There's the hood release down there. Here's your lamp control. Again, I'll try to block the glare a bit. Uh, but you have automatic where it can stay most of the time and then you can override that if you'd need to. I do like the aluminum or chrome trim on the end, it looks kind of nice. Then you have your trunk release and uh, traction control, defeat button there, and then this one here does the dome light and then changes the brightness of the instrument cluster and the displays. Uh, hazards right up here. This is basic stuff, tachometer, speedometer, uh, fuel and temperature gauge. These buttons over here uh, take you through various menus so you can go through and see uh, your tire pressure and stuff if, with the information. Um, up top you can do your trip, computer, range, economy, all those sorts of things. If you need a key change, you can have it cut at just about any hardware store and then you can program it yourself. And uh, same for the key fob, very, very, uh, very simple, very nice. Uh, the radio, so this is kind of, this is kind of one of the things that let this car down. This was really the only radio that they offered in this. Um, this is actually more like the premium radio. The base one had like less presets and there were a couple, of, and it didn't have auxiliary um, input, but this was kind of the up level one. Single CD slot here, auxiliary, you can toggle between those here. Um, basic controls all along. It does read out all your information that you have. Um, otherwise, this is also your clock. One cool thing about it is you can set all your presets here and then just select them with these buttons uh, as opposed to having to memorize what one, two, three, four, etc. represent. You can also put AM and FM stations and XM stations next to each other and then you can cycle through all these pages here of them, uh, which is kind of cool. There's your clock adjustment, um, this one here will let you really dial in the audio and then you can go through uh, here to the EQ and you have presets there. You can also search the radio by, uh, well I guess it's just XM, but category so you could pick like um, like jazz or rock or whatever you would want and then go through like that. Nice big power and volume button here in the middle which is nice. You, yeah, Decent stuff. Otherwise it's a double din so you can swap it out if you want to. But that's kind of it. That's, that's all they ever gave you. So uh, yeah, it was a little dated in that regard. <laughs> Moving on to the temperature and um, climate control here, everything is manual, but it is dual zone. These are the blanks for the heated seats, if you had that. Uh, AC and then rear defrost in the center, and then you can select the air um, across the whole cabin. You just have to select one setting. You can't control that independently. Otherwise, you have tweeters up here in the, um, in the column, or the pillar, I should say, and then you have ones in the base of the door. Uh, other options that you could get with these, uh, you could have, I think it was like an eight, maybe an eight speaker Bose audio system. Uh, you could also have leather seats. You would have power on the power seat, uh, a power seat on the passenger side. Um, different, you could have the sunroof, of course, different options. This does have leather trim on the steering wheel. It does have the folding rear seats. It has a CD player and the upgraded radio. So this has a lot of nice options, but um, there's a couple things you could get on top of that. The nicest thing really is just to have an aux jack. I mean, if it didn't have that, it really would be pretty ho horrible. Uh, visibility is decent. You can see it's a little bit blocked here and there, but it's not terrible. All right, let me get set up and we'll take this out for a drive. 
So just leaving the neighborhood here, a couple thoughts on, on the car. Uh, again, so it was this car's been produced for a long time, uh, not continuously, but uh, they started in the mid 50s and then they've been they've been making it uh, on and off since. This is kind of the last the last iteration of it that had the basic V6 uh, that wasn't too complex, didn't have direct injection, variable valve timing, dual overhead cams. It was still an overhead valve engine that was very simple uh, and also still had the simple um, four-speed automatic. So 2010 was the end of that. So that was that was it. This is the last, one of the last ones, uh, which is kind of interesting. I didn't really realize that when I bought it, but uh, it is kind of something to uh, be noteworthy. Anyway, so, you know, this is a very interesting car because it isn't really inspiring. There's nothing about it that's that great, but one word that you can use to describe it continuously across pretty much everything is just decent, right? It's nothing about it is horrendous, but none of it's super exciting. Uh, like I said, just leaving the neighborhood here, everything's nice and quiet. The suspension is nice. The seat is, of course, incredibly comfortable. Uh, the suspension's very soft. Um, very cushiony. It's not very sporty. We'll look at it later, but when you turn the steering wheel, it, um, it, it kind of makes the, the car dip and sway. It doesn't really corner very well, uh, but it, it, you know, it, it, it'll go around the corner. But it's very interesting that way. Everything's very soft. Everything's very quiet. Everything's very comfortable. Everything feels familiar. I grew up with cars like this. My dad has an 8th gen Impala and has for a really long time. Before that, we've had a you know, a number of GM vehicles. Uh, my granddad, I think he's had like five or six Impalas over the years. He had the, the nicer ones from back in the day, but it's kind of a thing that, you know, I'm just used to this, I'm used to this feel, uh, regardless of how good it is, I am used to it. Some of the ergonomics in this car are really strange. Um, the steering wheel is very big, uh, which is kind of odd. It's also very close. You almost can't get it far enough away from you which is interesting. The shifter falls right at hand. Uh, the door panel, if you're not too wide, is kind of far away. It's a little bit of a stretch, which is interesting. The brake pedal is, it feels to be like two or three inches higher than the accelerator pedal. So you really have to lift off and get on the brake. And then when you do press the brake, the first, it feels like almost 50% of it doesn't really do anything. All the braking takes place right at the end. So when you come, when you compress it all like that, there really isn't a lot of um, modulation that you can do with the braking, so it's kind of all or nothing. And then when the brakes grab, they really do grab. This car has pretty decent brakes, but they're not very crisp. They just, I mean, they slow the car, but that's about it. They're not very noteworthy. Other than that, if you, <laughs> we'll get to a straight section of road here, but if you turn the steering wheel just a little bit, the whole car will dip, but it won't really, it won't really turn. It doesn't really handle at high speed. Uh, you really do have to slow down for curves and bends, which again makes it really not sporty and doesn't really inspire you to drive in that sort of way, which is fine. Uh, the next thing with the four-speed automatic and the V6, it's very buttery smooth, so the engine feels great. I think the four-speed lets it down a little bit. It's, it's very smooth. It doesn't it's not very abrupt, it isn't rough, it isn't loud, but a five or six really would be a little bit nicer. And the thing is, this was 2010. I mean, Mercedes had switched to like seven speeds almost five years ago, so this was a little bit late to still have that, which makes it just a little bit more insulting. But if you can get past that, otherwise, it's very nice. Everything in here looks decent. Most of it's vinyl, plastic, and fabric. In fact, all of it may be, with the exception of two pieces of leather and possibly some real chrome. But it looks nice, um, everything works properly, it works as it should. You don't have a feeling that everything's going to break or fall apart um, in a couple years or so of sitting in the sun. Nothing in this car is faded or, or worn out. Uh, the stereo works well, the air conditioning works great, there's great AC, good heat. I uh, guess the car heated up and cooled down very quickly. Everything does work really well. My favorite part is just how quiet this cabin is. You don't really hear the engine below 4,000 RPMs. There's really not much of an exhaust note below that uh, RPM level. You can't really hear different things in the car working. You can feel the transmission shift just a little bit. You can definitely see, you know, you can watch the tachometer. The suspension works quietly. You don't really, there's not a lot of crashing when you go over bumps. I'm sure you can hear a little bit on camera, but uh, it's very quiet over bumps and things. You don't really hear too much from other cars. Uh, no real mechanical no noises. You don't hear like fan noises from the AC or anything like that. It's very, very quiet, which is 
very, very nice. I really like that. As far as power goes, there is a bit of power there. Um, there's a lot of nice torque right off the line. It isn't certain, certainly isn't, in, like I said, it's not inspiring, but it gives you a lot of confidence if you're getting on the highway. You can definitely get up to speed uh, quickly, which is kind of the point of it all. Uh, but other than that, you'll just want to kind of slow down and just enjoy cruising. This is a great highway car. Um, but you can definitely, you know, you don't have to worry about getting out of your own way. But once you do, you just kind of leave it at that. So it does have nice power. Um, other than that, the dynamics are a little bit floaty. You know, it's, it's it just gets the job the job done. The thing is, this car is very simple. Um, it's a little bit old fashioned. This car is for somebody that wants something that they can just drive around, not worry too much about, be transported in comfort without having to worry about a bunch of problems or worrying about having to figure out different controls or this and that. This is a very simple, basic, but nice car very decent the rest of the ownership experience should be pretty decent as well after all they made a couple million of these so there's a lot of used parts around if you'd want uh, parts availability is very easy to get so much of it's just basic off the shelf GM stuff there's a lot of space to kind of work on things if you'd want to do that um, you know I mean you'll have problems with this this isn't a Toyota but the thing is when when something does break it's not going to be the end of the world it won't be a catastrophe it's it's uh, pretty manageable. All right, we'll do a little acceleration test here. Yeah, just taking it easy here, but there we go. And uh, well, I kind of let it go there, but we're close to 60. Anyway, zero to 60 is in about six or seven seconds. Uh, and I don't even know if I mentioned power. This has about well, it depends on the year, but it has between 210 and 220 horsepower, depending on the year range that you uh, that you have, and about uh, 210 to 215 pound-feet of torque, right around in that neighborhood. So it's it's decent, but um, a little lower than most cars. And I think at the time this was bashed because the V6 that it had didn't really make that much horse, more horsepower than a four-cylinder. But the thing is that the refinement was so there. I mean the. The, the torque off the line and just the smoothness of it was better than any four cylinder ever would be, uh, which was kind of a uh, kind of a positive of it. So the uh, the V6 was mainly for refinement, in my opinion. And besides that, as far as fuel economy went, it, it did just as well, if not better, than some four cylinders, just like the 3800 and 3400 before it. I think this one was rated for around 20 or 20, maybe, eight, no, I think it was 18 city and 29 highway, which is not bad, um, certainly not bad for the time. It's a little low now, uh, but again, this is without any trickery, no turbos, no direct injection, no valve timing, um, no active cylinder management, none of it. So just a simple V6. All right, so that's about all there is to say about the ninth gen Impala. Um, just a very basic, simple vehicle. Um, one thing to note is that, you know, used, there's so many cars now on the market from this era, you can get pre-owned that this isn't such a great value as it once was, but it's still decent. And again, if you're looking for something that's simple, serviceable, usable, uh, fairly reliable, good on fuel, um, this is a a very uh, very unique vehicle in that regard so anyway all right hope you enjoyed uh, if you did consider subscribing and we'll see you with the next one thank you